Access TV. Flashing crowds going crazy. Here comes the boy. He's out of control, can't be stopped. Everyone knows that he's on top. Welcome to Scottsdale, Arizona. Welcome to The Voice Versus. Hello, everybody. I'm Michael Chiavello. My guest today on The Voice Versus really needs no introduction in the martial arts or movie world. He's a seventh down black belt in the Japanese art of Aikido. He's the star of such films as Out for Justice, Mark for Death, Above the Law, Hard to Kill, and Under Siege. His name? Steven Seagal. Wow, Steven Seagal, a larger-than-life figure, controversial, charismatic, shrouded in mystery and myth. And today on the show, we're going to try and unravel some of those mysteries and debunk some of those myths. So sit back and strap yourselves in for the longest interview ever conducted with Steven Seagal in his entire career. Welcome to another episode of The Voice Versus. Steven Seagal, thanks for joining me on The Voice Versus. It's an absolute pleasure. You began practicing Aikido, you shifted to Japan. Can you tell me how you first became involved in Aikido? Because it does intrigue me that, you know, Aikido developed by the Japanese by a much shorter man, Morihei Oshiba, O sensei, and you yourself about 6'5, larger individual. How did it come to be Aikido that was your chosen art? Well, actually, I started studying karate at a very young age. I, um, sort of lied about my age and got a job washing dishes at a uh, restaurant. I think it was called the Wagon Wheel or something like that. And um, there was a, uh, a cook there, because back then in America you didn't really have dojos around. You didn't have people teaching Kung Fu and you know, Korean arts and Chinese and Japanese, they just didn't have it. They were all sort of underground or quietly teaching. And uh, one of the cooks there was a guy called Sakamoto Sensei, and he was a Shotokan guy and an Okinawan Shorin uh, guy. And he saw that when I was washing the dishes and moving around, that, that I moved very fast and loved the martial arts. And one of the other guys in the kitchen, I don't even know what he was, he was a Mexican guy who claimed to be a boxer and, you know, he was one of these kind of controversial guys that loved to talk about how great boxing was and how great he was. And anyway, Sakamoto Sensei decided to take me under his wing and teach me. I had asked him over and over again if he would and then I ended up learning from him karate, the basics. It was mostly Okinawan. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I studied from him for many years, and then finally uh, found someone who could teach me Aikido. I was very interested in the Aikido. Uh, as you know, I had met uh, Demura Sensei and mm -hmm. some of the people from Shitoryu. Never really studied with them much, became very good friends. And. Um, we did some demonstrating together, and we demonstrated karate at this place that they had, which was a theme park, like a Japanese theme park in Orange County somewhere. I think it was called the Deer Park. And um, so Demura Sensei and I and a bunch of the guys, who are not all studio, by the way, we, we all demonstrated karate there. Um, and about that time, I was... I found a, a master in Aikido named Isaka Kyoshi, who became kind of the most important martial arts master of my life. Mm. And I devoted uh, all my time to him, became his closest disciple. And uh, well, I don't know if I was his closest disciple, but he was my closest teacher. And certainly I loved him the most and devoted everything I had to him. And. Um, he really was the most important martial arts teacher of my life. Of course, the founder of Aikido, Morihei Oshiba, O-sensei, passed away in 1969. Did you ever meet O-sensei? And if you did, did you develop a relationship with him? Did you train with him at all? No, by the time 
Well, since I was getting old, um, you know, I, I was quite young. I was 18, something like that. I had gotten to, my, my father was uh, in Japan uh, having to do with some military stuff, and he allowed me to come with him. I was able to meet um, uh, one of my closest friends, uh, Isoyama Sensei, and uh, go to Ibaragi when O Sensei was alive in Tokyo and got to see him, got to hear him. Uh, I wouldn't say that I got to study with him or get thrown by him or anything else. I really, in that way, didn't know him. Um, and then soon after that, he became ill and wasn't teaching much, and soon after that, he passed away. But I did um, make very, very close friends with the guys that I thought were his closest students, and I felt that the mystical things, the thing that I found the most interesting about those times was, Osezo wasn't talking about put your left foot here and your right arm here and flip the guy this way and punch him that way. He was really talking about mysticism, and he was a kind of a priest in this place called Omotokyo, and he was the student of Deguchi Onisaburo Sensei and Deguchi Naohi. Um, Deguchi Naohi was his teacher, and she was still alive, and I went there to study from her, which I did do, um, and I did learn a lot of the mystical things that he was teaching that nobody else seemed to understand because they weren't really interested in that. They were interested in learning how to fight. So that was my beginning uh, in that way. What were some of these mystical things that Osensei was trying to accomplish that you wanted to learn? Because I remember you said in an interview once you wanted to transcend just the physical training of Aikido and learn the mystical side as Osensei had taught. Well, I mean, I've been doing the martial arts for 40 some odd years now, and uh, maybe 50 years, I could say, huh? Um, I don't know if I'm any closer to uh, enlightenment now than I was then. I have had moments of what seemed to me at the time to be great realization. I have had moments of techniques that seem to be uh, unexplainable or divine or spectacular, but I've never been able to keep that level of divine or mystical technique consistent so that I could always do it and understand it. It would seem to come and go without my really knowing when it would come and go, and so I'm still sort of uh, the average fool on the corner trying to you know, put one foot in front of the other. Still to come on The Voice versus Steven Seagal, we talk more about Aikido and traditional martial arts. Welcome back to The Voice versus Steven Seagal. Let's talk more about Aikido and the traditional martial arts. In your time teaching in Japan, as Take Sensei, as you were known, you, you were... know who gave me that name no. was was Deguchi Naohi. Oh, was uh, O Sensei's teacher is the one who gave me that name. Fantastic. That's right. And during that time, you were known for a very hard, practical style of Aikido. What you were teaching was that close to what O Sensei had developed, or were you taking a more aggressive, harder style of Aikido that you were teaching? I believe that in Aiki we had something called Go Juju, which was the, the circle, the square, and the triangle. And, um, you know, the hard, the medium, and the soft, but the soft was the most severe. And that's, that was the riddle that most people didn't understand. Um, I grew up in a very, very dangerous area, an area that was all gangsters, yakuza, fighting every day in Shinjuku and in. in, in uh, Osaka when I finally went there. Uh, I believe that O Sensei had something called Okuden, which meant the secret uh, style or the secret arts that, that he wouldn't teach almost anyone, which did have to do with killing people and did have to do with techniques that could take a life and so forth and so on. And I think after his, you know, supposed, and I don't say this out of disrespect, but I, I, I don't know, you know, after his apparent enlightenment, whatever that means, because I don't understand what it means, 
he apparently took all those techniques out and wasn't showing those anymore, but I did know the old people who did know them, and I made those a part of my style, and I made the attitude based on my understanding of Aikido, which is that you have, you know, the gentle, the supple, the sublime, the soft, the severe, and the wrathful, and I felt very, very... Um, uh, convicted, you know, I, I felt tremendous conviction uh, in the fact that Aikido has to be able to work against anyone in any style who wants to come and kill you or your family or your friends or hurt you. I felt that Aikido could be as severe as any art and I made it that way and once again I'll mention the name of Isoyama Sensei. Him and I, you know, both had that same attitude and him and I had the unfortunate displeasure of having to test our skills hundreds of times. And I remember there was the ridiculous question in there of, have you ever had to use Aikido? And that was one of the ones I was looking for to tell you we probably shouldn't, you know, address that. But uh, yeah, hundreds of times, you know, uh, we've had to, you know, use this in, in the streets. And that's how you know what works and what doesn't I was going to say, it must give you a sense of satisfaction, though. Even though you don't want to use it ever for self-defense, you hope you never get into that predicament, it must well, give you a sense of satisfaction to know that what you are teaching and what you have learned works. It's not satisfaction. Uh, forgive me for, for sure, no. contradicting you. But it is uh, very important to learn what works. Like one of my teachers once said, Shinkei Shobo are fighting for real in the street or wherever you are and then practicing on the mat is the difference between swimming on the mat and swimming in the water. Mm -hmm. You know, and you have to fight for real. And if you don't fight for real, I don't want to come up with any superlatives for you because it's not all about fighting, but you will never understand you know, really the essence of, of what any martial art is without having to, you know, really defend yourself. Uh, very good point. You know, so. In your days of instructing back in Japan, apparently your gratings were legendary. They took place behind closed doors. Can you tell me what a Takasensei grading would have consisted of for a black belt grading back in the day? Back in the day, people were giving out black belts in one or two years. My average shodan was six years. Wow. Back in the day. And back in the day, we took three to five guys, depending on who you were. And after you went through all of the different techniques showing, you know, piece by piece what you could do, in the end, you lined up three to five guys, you put them across the room, and you said, begin. Mm. And they would attack you as hard as they could, and they would do anything they could to take you out. And we constantly had people who would have broken nose, knocked out teeth, mm. black eyes, ripped open face. And uh, there, there was never, ever a black belt exam where people walked away without blood everywhere. Times have changed, though, haven't they? It's uh, rare, have if anywhere, you'll find today that it takes more than a couple of years to achieve a black belt in most styles. I mean, and, and nobody comes at you that hard anymore. And I used to tell the guys, and they'd say, well, can we come as hard as we can? I'd say, yeah, you go as hard as you can, but keep in mind, the harder you come, the harder he's coming back. Yeah, yeah. When we return to The Voice versus Steven Seagal, Seagal talks about the transition from martial arts master to overnight Hollywood sensation. Welcome back to The Voice versus Steven Seagal. After a successful career as a martial arts instructor in Japan, Steven Seagal returned to America to forge a career as a Hollywood star. In 1988, he came out of nowhere to feature in his first smash hit, Above the Law. You're moving on to, uh, you're moving to, into Hollywood. I mean, going from martial arts instructor to Hollywood actor, virtually overnight, you came out of nowhere in 1988 with Above the Law, whereas... 1985, 86. You were doing some choreography and some martial arts training with the likes of Sean Connery, correct, during the mid-80s. Your first role, though, is a, a major feature role, and you, you didn't start with smaller roles like so many actors did, and there's so many stories that float around as to how you got involved in Hollywood. One is that Mike Ovitz was a former student of yours, and he took you to Warner Brothers. You did an Aikido demonstration, and Warner Brothers was blown away, and boom, Steven Seagal became a movie star. Is that true, and if not, I, how did it I happen? I hate to admit it, that is true. Okay. 
That's a true story. You still remember the day? You still remember the I remember demonstration? remember everything about it, yeah. Were you... You introduced a new style of martial arts that no one had ever seen on the silver screen. Right. People used to kick punches of, you know, your Bruce Lees and your Chuck Norrises and your Van Dams, etc. But he was Aikido. Was there ever any trepidation from you or the producers, the guys at Warner Brothers, that this stuff might not work on screen? There were no flashy kicks and jumping round kicks and flashy stuff. It was mostly joint locks and holds and throws. What most people don't know is that they probably did have some kind of... Uh uh, how do you say, Shinpai means uh, like, you know, maybe they were a little concerned about that. Reservations, maybe? Reservations. Yeah. And so they did ask me to do a screen test, mm. and I did. And they said, man, you know, this guy has got so much, you know, going on. He's got the charisma, he's got the look, he's got the action. We, we feel confident after that. And so they handed me two or three scripts, and they said, you know, make any of these you want. I read them. I came to America as a writer. Mm. And um, I didn't like any of them. I said, you know, I think we can do better than this. And they said, well, there's a writer's strike coming up, so maybe if you want to you, you write something. And I said, yeah, I want to write something. And they said, well, there's a writer's strike coming up. And the timing is going to be difficult if you don't write it quickly. Can we assign some folks to help you? I said, sure. And they assigned me uh, Stephen Pressfield and Ronnie Shusett. And together we all wrote Above the Law, yeah. Which, in interviews, you've said that Above the Law was part autobiograph autobiographical in, in segments. Well, I'm not going to get into that, but I mm -hmm. will say that I believe it was based on a true story which had to do with the Iran-Contra, you know, conspiracy, which really never came out. Your first five films are considered classics of the genre. Above the Law, Hard to Kill, Mark for Death, Out for Justice, Under Siege, classics. I was a huge fan back in the day when I first fought, saw Above the Law. I must have been 13 years old and I was so into you, I think I whispered everything for a month afterwards just to imitate your voice. Out of all the characters you played, Nico Toscani, Mason Storm, John Hatcher, Gino Fellino and Casey Ryback, which of those characters was the most fun to play, most memorable? That's a tough question. I think maybe, you know, Above the Law was... The most fun for me. Yeah. Yeah. Under Siege, I have to ask the question, one or two? Which one did you prefer? I should prefer Under Siege 2 to Under Siege 1. I think I like Under Siege 1. Yeah? Yeah. I like them both. Yeah, I like them both too. They're both classics. Oh, so many fight scenes in so many films that you've done. My favourite one, I suppose, the out for justice cue ball fight was that's fantastic. my favorite also. it's your favorite as well yeah that's my favorite. what made that one your favorite well i improvise you know in special forces you know uh we say something like you know there's this phrase that is common amongst operators we say adapt and overcome and coming up with the idea of putting that cue ball inside a rag and using it against all those people was a really good idea that really works it did I can tell you, I, I mean, that will hurt somebody very badly. And so, <laughs> I, I like that. And then, you know, Danny Nasanto is a dear friend of mine, still is a dear friend of mine. He, as you know, was one of Bruce Lee's teachers, uh, brilliant knife fighter, great at his grandma, Cali, uh, and all that stuff. And him and I had done a lot of practice together and working together. And I tried to learn from him, and I think he tried to learn from me. And so, being able to work with him uh, that day and fight him was a great pleasure for me. I was going to say, Dan Nasanto, at one stage, Bruce Lee's number one student. You also... Uh, and teacher. And teacher. Friends with James Coburn as well, who uh, was you one of Bruce Lee's that. students. You indeed, that. indeed. That's how I met Bruce Lee, was through James Tell me, Coburn. I was going to ask. So you've met, you met Bruce Lee. Through Tell James me about Coburn. your experiences with Bruce and what was he like and how did you get on with him? You know, I wasn't around Bruce much. He... Was a kind of guy who kind of would badmouth most uh, a, a, a lot of the other martial artists and martial arts uh, in a in a kind of a sarcastic way, fun way, which I understood. For some reason, he never had anything bad to say about me. And I was quite interested in Aikido, and he was very nice to me. 
uh, he knew that I grew up in Asia and that I had a son that was half just exactly the same age as Brandon. And when I met Brandon, he had lighter hair and said, this is my little Caucasian boy, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, you know, uh, oh. I, I thought Bruce was a really great guy, a really cool guy. And I thought James Coburn was a great guy, too, and I'm really sorry they're all gone. And, when Brandon was killed like that, um, they called me a few minutes after it happened. It was in Carolina somewhere. They called me in the middle of the night. They said, we think that he's dead, and, but the guy shot a blank gun at him. Uh, how could he be dead? He's dying. He, he's you know, severely hurt, maybe dead. And I said, you will find a projectile in him. You'll find a bullet in him. And they said, that can't be. You're crazy. And I said, you will find a bullet in him. And they called me in the morning. They said, you're amazing. And I said, why? And they said, there was a bullet in him. Uh -huh. And um, I can go through the whole story on what really happened, which most people don't know. But the long and the short is when Brandon passed like that, I, I, I didn't sleep for three or four days. Uh -huh. uh, it just reminded me too much of certain things. and. Uh, the loss of both of them was terrible for me. Another great actor, one of my favorites, and I know he's one of your favorites as well, Jackie Chan, man who sent me flowers for my 21st birthday, coincidentally. And by the way, you and I same, share the same birthday, April 10. Uh, you were one of the people, and it's a little known fact, who helped Jackie Chan break into America and introduce him to American audiences. Can you tell me about your relationship with Jackie and how that started? I mean, I've known Jackie for, Jesus, maybe 40 years. Wow. I've known him from way back in, in the early days. Um, I'm not very close with him anymore. Um, I don't really go to Hong Kong or China much anymore. Um, him, Samuel Hong, a lot of the old... You know, some of this is really uh, maybe not quite fit for, you know, saying out loud on, on, on film, but... There's an interesting group of folks that, you know, are kind of some in the shadows and some in the light. And I was friends with all those guys for a long time. Um, haven't seen Jackie for a long time now. But at one time, I thought we were kind of good friends, mm -hmm. you know. In an interview, you also said once you'd made many great movies, which you have, and said you'd made many, or some, bad movies. Is there one particular film you look back on, you sort of cringe and go, geez, did I, did I really well, do that? Unfortunately, there's many. <laughs> I think, you know, I was looking at a, a, an actor the other day on screen, and I was going, holy shit. Can you say shit on this interview? You can say whatever you like. Yeah. I said, holy shit, did this guy actually do this? Not only was the movie that bad, but the acting was that bad. Mm. And it's a pretty famous actor. Mm. And I just said, hey, man, happens to all of us. We all, because we are, I don't want to say victims, but we are subject to the finances and what they want us to do and the studios and what they want us to do, and we don't control the show. Mm. So I made a lot of terrible movies and a few good ones. If all your movies were lost forever and some freak fire and all the show reels were gone, but one survived for you to be able to show your grandkids one day, which one movie of yours would you hope survived? It'd probably be on deadly ground because of the speech in the end mm -hmm. which you know is exactly what Al Gore did you know 18 years later then he got an Academy Award and a Nobel Peace Prize yes. for I was a little ahead of my time and I understand they cut quite a, that, quite a bit of that speech out it was originally much longer and it really just covered the entire gamut of what's happening with the, the planet and the environment but um i don't really know what's left i'd like to rent it just to see but i think you know for mankind that's probably the most important work i've done in my opinion and then you know uh fire down blue was also yeah. another, another important environmental movie so but i think on deadly ground the speech in the end with the slides was very important who's the most legitimate hollywood tough guy in your opinion you accept it of course when you say tough guy, do you mean martial artist or just tough I mean, guy? I mean, Stephen, for real. If he was on the street and there was a situation, you wanted this Hollywood guy by your side because he could defend himself. It's that hard to think of a legit one? 
Can you think of one? Michael Jai White. Can I laugh in your face? Really? Yes. Thoughts on Jean-Claude Van Damme? Can I laugh in your face? Chuck Norris? I mean, Chuck is in his mid-70s. He's probably 76 years old, OK? 75, 76 years old. Interesting. So I don't know. I don't, I, I've heard that he's not, you know. So I mean, I don't really want to get into, on film anyway, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who's a tough guy. Do I think Michael is a tough guy? No. Do I think he's a martial artist? No. Do I think Jean-Claude's a tough guy or a martial artist? No. If you were to put together your own ensemble of action stars, your own version of the Expendables, let's say, who would you choose, three or four actors, to be in there with you? I think they had many great actors in there, you know, that are great action guys. I think um, this guy Jason Stratham, is that Jason right? Statham. Statham, yeah. is it? Yeah. It's not Stratham, it's Statham. Statham. Yep. Jason Statham is a wonderful action guy. Uh, Jet Li, fantastic action guy, who, by the way, is a real martial artist. Yes, great wushu. And, you know, I mean, I'd never seen him fight, but... I would imagine if you would have mentioned his name over those guys, I would have to say, okay, he's a real martial artist and probably can fight. Yeah. Dolph Lundgren, Kyokushin Karateka, used to be competitive. Oh, he's a very nice guy. Do I think he's a, a tough guy and a great martial artist? He's just a great guy and, you know, but, but anyway, so, but... Uh, I'm trying to think of all the guys that were in there. I didn't get to see it, but... Um, you know, Jet Li and, uh, you know, Jason Stratham are great guys. Who else was in it? Dolph Lundgren, Terry Crews, Randy Couture. Randy's a real fighter. Mm hmm Yep. You know? Of course, Bruce Willis and Arnie, we know both aren't real fighters, but great actors. They're great actors. Mm -hmm. And, and, and Sly Stallone. Yeah, you got all those great actors there. Yeah. All those great actors, yeah. Folks, you may be wondering at this stage of the interview why I haven't asked Steven Seagal about the rumour that he was once choked out on set by judo Jean LaBelle. Steven Seagal was adamant off-camera that he did not want to give Jean LaBelle any publicity during this interview. He said he had met Jean LaBelle on set once, and all that ever done together was stretch, and in no way, shape or form had LaBelle ever choked him out. He also said that LaBelle once claimed he knocked out Bruce Lee, knocked out Jim Brown, that Jean LaBelle is a pathological liar, a scumbag, and other choice words I choose not to say on television. So make up your own mind about that apparent rumour. More when we return here to The Voice versus Steven Seagal. Welcome back to Scottsdale, Arizona and The Voice versus Steven Seagal. I'm Michael Chiavello. Coming up next, let's talk to Steven Seagal about the mixed martial arts world, his work with Anderson Silva, Leolta Machida, his thoughts on mixed martial arts, and of course that famed front kick that Anderson used to knock out Vitor Balfort that allegedly was taught to him by Steven Seagal. Let's talk a little bit about mixed martial arts. Your relationship with Anderson Silva, how did you and Anderson Silva first come into contact? Anderson sent me a card saying, teach me your lethal stuff, teach wow. me your great stuff. And then um, there was a phone number of a guy called George Joy Madison. I called George and he said, yeah, man, Anderson's a big fan. He knows about, you know, all of your lethal stuff. And would you come and teach him? And I said, Let me, let's meet and talk. And we met and talked. And I thought he's very sincere, very humble, and that it would be a good thing to do. So. I went to Black House and started teaching him, yeah. After Anderson knocked out Vitor Belfort, he said the front kick he won the fight with was taught to him by you. Gave you credit for that, which was, you know, fantastic and sort of introduced you back into the world of mixed martial arts fans. But there were a lot of people also questioning the, the validity of that, of how an Aikido instructor would teach a Muay Thai guy a version of a front kick. I mean, whoever says that doesn't know anything about my life. I mean, I had spent my entire life I, first of all, I started out in karate. Sure, yeah. You know, my so you started first, out doing Magedi in karate. Yeah, yeah, I started, you know, for, for many years before I even began Aikido. So, And then I went around the world studying from, you know, Kung Fu masters, Muay Thai masters, you know, and uh, Tai Chi masters. And so I've been doing mixed martial arts for 40 years. 
And so whoever says that just doesn't know anything about me. Would you believe you're one of the original mixed martial artists in that you're probably no. one of the first guys to train in so many different styles that's high profile, of course? No, I think there are millions of other guys that were doing the same thing. We just didn't use the word mixed martial arts, but that's what we did because we wanted to study everything we could to make sure that whoever we're fighting, we are covered for the different kinds of, you know, situations that we might be in. We would know what to do on the ground. We would know what to do with kicks, punches, elbows, grappling, joint locks, whatever. We want to know how to do it. A lot of the old wisdom and knowledge and essence is lost today in the modern world a lot of what the old masters had and have is beyond most of your modern practitioners comprehension because nowadays you have stuff like UFC for example where people are getting in there and physically they are you know uh, it's wonderful in the sense that they're physically you know trying to kind of understand the limits of you know their talent and their skill and getting in there and testing it out and and they're great athletes and some of them are great martial artists and so forth and so on but the spiritual training that most of the old guys in the olden days used to go through in order to culminate the development of the physical self and the perfection of the spiritual self simultaneously, that's almost lost these days. And like Lyoto Machido, who's a dear friend of mine and a student of mine, his father and I are about the same age and we are cut from the same cloth. Yeah. We went through the same things with the same people. Him and I talk about this a lot. This is something that we really understand and I, I have friends like his father and Isuyama Sensei and I could go down the list who are in their 60s and their 70s who could kill mm -hmm. most of the guys who think they're great warriors that are in their 20s or 30s kill them instantly but that stuff that most people who will hear this will go oh come on that's a joke uh, well, amongst real martial arts masters, it's not a joke. Exactly. I mean, I take, for example, one of my favorite martial arts masters ever, Sosei Masoyama, who invented Kyokushin Karate. And there's a man who passed away in later age and, you know, was, could still knock out people with one punch and kill with one punch. He used to kill bulls and do shuto strikes and shave the horns off bulls and, you know, the amazing feats he of power. He was a good friend of mine. He was? Good friend of mine. Tremendous. I, you know... I was, um in Kazakhstan, I think. I was somewhere crazy in the world the other day, maybe six months ago, something like that. And there was a big Kyokushinkai, how do you say in English, like... like um, a gathering or a convention? Well, yeah, convention, yeah, something okay. like that. And they were doing all this, uh, you know, demonstrations and fighting and competition and all the old senpai, all the old, you know, Kyokushinkai masters yeah. were there. And they saw me come in. This was like chilling. And they were, oh, you know, he's here, he's here. And they made me come and sit with the other masters, and they introduced me as their senpai. Wow, what a tremendous honor. Tremendous honor. You have mentioned in interviews that the kick you taught Anderson is something you, like, had in the bank. You had in the file from many, many, many years ago. Can you elaborate a little more on, on the kick? And is it a, a, your own version of a Maigeti, of a it's teeth not, kick? It's not. Anyway... It, Everyone can say, oh, it's just a Maigeti. It's not just a Maigeti. What I tried to teach him and Leodo, you see, most people, when they do Maigeti, they lift the leg and they kick. Sure. What I'm trying to teach people to do without giving away any trade secrets is to kick like this so you mm -hmm. don't see it coming. You don't lift up and kick. You kick like this. And it's the way you hold your, your foot it's not like this, like a lot of people do in there. You'll see it all the time. But it's like this, so it's like a spear. A lot of people do do this to protect the toes. Is there a danger of breaking the toes? In well, the you have describing? to lift your toes up. Okay. You lift your toes up and you're kicking with here. Okay. So that's, you know, but it's, it is not a classic, typical Maigeti. It's different. And with Lyoto Mashidi, you mentioned that you are helping him with his punching. Can you elaborate a bit more on, again, what an Aikido stylist and a mixed martial artist like yourself, as you say, is teaching a guy like, like Leota when it comes to the handiwork. For example, I don't turn my hand when I punch. You don't corkscrew the hand? No. 
I, when I punch, I punch like this because it's faster and it comes from here, doesn't come here, doesn't come from here, it comes from down here. How do you mean if you're punching? Say if you're punching my hand. Well, it's here. Okay. Yeah. So, and I drop my hand down and it comes from my body. It doesn't come from my shoulder or my hips. Come, my whole body flies. Right. So it's very different. My punches are very different. And they're quick, you know. Uh, and um, I mean, you know, like I said, Leodo's father and I are the same. Yeah. But we're also a little different because some of my teachers were different from his. And in some ways, he's envious of me and who I got to study with and vice versa. But, you know, he has two great teachers in his father and I. And I think um, there's just some unique stuff that I'm teaching Yoda that, that he wouldn't be learning from anywhere else, I don't think. Now, this intrigues me. Are there many techniques, do you believe, out there in the whole world of martial arts that the public still haven't seen displayed thousands, successfully in MMA? Thousands. Hundreds of thousands. There's so many. I mean, and I, I don't want to say I know much because I don't really know anything, but I've forgotten more techniques than most people have learned. Wow. If you could choose to work with any other mixed martial artist that you haven't worked with yet, who would you choose? Who are you a fan of? I mean, I'm working with, I'm working with who I want to work with. You know, those are two of my favorite guys. There's plenty of other great, you know, fighters out there. And to me, anybody who enters the ring, enters the octagon, is, is, a, is a great warrior. And... I automatically respect them. Uh, I don't like the concept of people doing the interviews and bad-mouthing the other guy, and I'm going to do this to him, and I'm going to do that to him, and he's this, and he's that. And I think that that's a disgrace to the martial arts, and I don't like it at all. And maybe some people are being uh, egged on to do that for publicity, but I don't like that. Well, it begs a question that I've asked before in interviews. Are most mixed martial artists actually martial artists, or are they fighters? I mean, most of them are fighters. They don't embody the true martial arts spirit, the true bushido spirit. Well, I mean, you know, so, but... You were talking about speed before, particularly in relating to Lyoto Mashida. How fast are you still at 60 years old? And when you're sparring guys like Lyoto and Anderson, how fast are you still? You should ask them that. I don't want to answer that. Do you believe you're still as fast as you were even 10 years ago? Maybe faster. Really? In another life, would you have chosen to be a mixed martial arts fighter? In yeah. the cage, I mean? No. Yeah. Not for you? We just, we believe in keeping, you know, all of this as secret as we can. And, you know, there's just a lot of stuff we don't teach. Still to come on The Voice versus Steven Seagal, we talked to Steven about his work in law enforcement, particularly on the border between Mexico and Arizona. Welcome back to The Voice versus Steven Seagal in Scottsdale, Arizona. While he's been a movie star for the better part of a quarter of a century, it's a little-known fact that for more than 20 years, Steven Seagal has been involved in the law enforcement industry. So I ask him the question, why does a movie star like himself, who could sit back and enjoy a lifestyle of parties, fine-looking women, poolside, cocktails, choose to engage and put his life in jeopardy working the border patrol between Mexico and the United States? Moving on to another topic, you do a lot of law work, particularly on the border here in Arizona. What makes a movie star like yourself who could sit back and live the lifestyle of a movie star, relax, coast through life, what makes you want to put your life on the line against, you know, drug traffickers, human traffickers, rapists and the likes protecting the border? Why, why do that? I'm a warrior and that's in my blood. I also like to protect my country, and I do that on the border as best I can. I also like to do the little bit I can to take the bad guys off the streets, murderers, rapists, arms, armed robbers, people who are terrible for society, you know, terrible for your wife and your children to have to live in the same planet with, you know. I'm hoping that those guys can all be put away so they can't victimize any more people. 
you're up against some of the most dangerous and depraved people in the world when you're doing this line of work. What's the most dangerous situation you've ever found yourself in doing this work? Well, I mean, I think being shot at and, you know, kicking in doors where you know there's bad guys in there with guns that are going to try to shoot you if they can, stuff like that. Have you ever been shot? Yes. Stabbed? Cut, not stabbed. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. Are you always armed? Yes. Right now, if I was to look around this room, would I find an arm of some sort that you've brought with you? Yes. You once stated in an interview that you feel more Asian than American. Is that still the case? Well, I mean, I was raised in Asia. It was a real impressionable times for me because I was over there very young in age and uh, just the most formative uh, moments of my life were there under great teachers so that's where I got my culture from my knowledge my wisdom my you know most of the way I think was learned there is it true that also you have a grandmother in your lineage that is Mongolian is that true well no, no it's really probably on my my father's side okay. because uh, all I have is a picture of uh, my father's uh, family, and they got pretty slanted eyes and Asian clothes. So <laughs> they look like Russian Mongols, but I don't know what they are, but they're something Asian. Speaking of Russian, you were in Russia just last week with uh, Vladimir Putin, with Fedor Emelianenko. Tell me about that experience, because you were personally invited by Putin, I believe, to go to Russia. What was that like? Well, I mean, I think the thing, I love Vladimir Putin, and I think he's a wonderful human being, a great world leader, a real man, and I think he loves the martial arts. Uh, the first time I went to his home many years ago, he had a life-size statue of Kano Jigoro. <laughs> wow, the founder of Judo. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> he's just a great guy. I have uh, tremendous respect for him, and I love what he's done for the martial arts uh, in Russia. Uh, and around the world and so I want to go there and participate in that and uh, we went to one uh, event together and uh, It was just an honor for me to be with him Coming up when we return to the voice versus Steven Seagal I asked Steven about his spiritual side and also what legacy he'd like to leave to the world Welcome back to The Voice versus Steven Seagal. It's no secret that Steven Seagal is a Buddhist and apparently was once declared a tulku, that is a reincarnation of a 17th century Buddhist monk. Let's get into the spiritual side now of Steven Seagal, ask him about his Buddhist life and what legacy he'd like to leave. In 1997, you were recognized as a Tibetan Lama or a tulku that you were the reincarnation of a 17th century Buddhist monk named Chundrag Dorje. Can you tell me more about that and what that meant? Well, without going into any great detail, I've been a Buddhist since I was a child, since I was a young boy. I started out being around Japanese Buddhists and somehow gravitated into Tibetan Buddhism. Um, my teachers recognized me as that person but it's never really meant much to me in the sense that we don't believe that it's who you were as much as who you are in this life and um, if I can learn anything from you know uh, past life memories or any of the great things that Chindrak Dorje did uh, that would be great but I think I just like to keep my shoulder to the wheel and uh, you know learn as much as I can about Buddhism and h how to help others, how to have compassion, how to make the world a better place. And to me, Buddhism is more about altruism and compassion and how you live your life and trying to make the world a better place than it is a religion. Have you ever thought of branching into comedy roles in acting? I mean, I, saw, I remember I saw a Mountain Dew ad in which you were absolutely hilarious. I, I think I can be very funny. Everyone who knows me thinks I can be very funny. I would love to do a comedy if uh, the right one came along. If you could go back in time, Stephen, and change anything about your life, at any period of your life, what would you choose if you chose anything? 
Well, without getting too personal, I would just say that my biggest flaw is that I want to believe that not all people are evil. And I want to be able to trust people. And I've trusted the wrong people many times. And it's been extremely costly. Extremely costly because there are scam artists and liars and thieves and criminals that will say anything you want to hear and can do some of the most damage that, you know, can possibly be inflicted, you know. When you leave this world, as we all will one day, what legacy do you hope that you leave? I mean, you know, I've worked very hard to try to make the world a better place with how I've helped people um, in just kindness and giving away everything I had to give in trying to work to make the environment better, to try to fight against those who are destroying the environment. I've pretty much done everything I can do to be all I can be and help others and help the world be a better place in my small way. I'm a small person and what I've done is minuscule in the grand scheme of things. Be that as it may, under God, under Lord Buddha, under all the things that I believe in and all the things that I consider to be sacred, I have tried very hard to be a good man and to help others and I will continue to try. Has any of your work in law enforcement, has any of your acting, any of your martial arts ever contradicted your spiritual beliefs? I mean, you know, in other people's minds, I'm sure that it could because people tend to, you know, always be very judgmental and uh, not always, but, you know, oftentimes, and it's very hard for people to really understand the essence of others, where they come from, what they're really doing. For example, I have the feeling that one of the things that you're saying is, for example, well, if you're a Buddhist, how could you be a cop? Well, I became a cop to try to help others. I became a cop to try to get the bad guys off the street. I became a cop to save lives. In many times in my life, I got to take someone who is a murderer or a rapist and get them off the street. I've saved many people's lives during Katrina in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was there, you know, I got to save lives there uh, as a police officer. So that to me is more important than sitting up on a throne in robes and, you know, preaching the gospel. Uh, I, I don't mind diving in the water to save a life. I don't mind getting my hands dirty to help someone who needs help. If you had to choose the most rewarding experience other than family, of course, which is so rewarding for all of us, would it be the work helping people out in Katrina and situations like that that you've done over and above your martial arts accomplishments or your movie accomplishments or anything yes, else? Yes, yes. Those, those are the things that matter the most, saving lives and helping people. Stephen, thank you so much for your time. As I said, I've always been a big fan of you as a martial artist, of your many charitable undertakings and you know we didn't talk about your helping animals around the world as well you're a big dog lover helping to save animals lives in various countries your work on the border and keeping us all safe and as one of the most legitimate martial artists old school martial artists and a man who was the first westerner to ever operate his own aikido dojo in japan which i think is a, a massive achievement as well and i just want to say thank you for joining us on the show today and it's been an absolute pleasure thank you sir Splashing, crowds going crazy, here comes the boy. He's out of control, can't be stopped, everyone knows that he's on top.